the programs. Before we start tonight, I would like to take this time to thank our, our wonderful sponsors, the Greenleaf Foundation, making small grants to nonprofits that promote organic farming, gardening, and community development in New England, and Dr. Bronner's, all one, good for body and planet. We are very grateful to our sponsors this evening. And thank you to all of our NOFA members who may be on the webinar with us. We cannot do the work that we do, whether it's in policy, whether it's in soil technical assistance, food access, this webinar without your support, it really helps our education and policy efforts. If you are not a member of NOFA Mass, I encourage you to become one. Um, you can go to our website at nofamass.org to find out how you can be a member. There are various ways to do it, or you can contact me directly and I can assist you with that. So I'm very excited about this webinar tonight. Our presenter is Evan Abrisom. He is the Pollination Systems Designer and Corridor Plan Planner for Landscape Interactions. He did a spectacular workshop at the NOFA Mass Winter Conference. Some of you may have seen him. And so we get a chance to get a round two of his wonderful uh, presentation in a shorter form tonight. All right, thanks, Anna. Welcome everyone. Um, Tonight, I'm gonna to be talking to you about biodiversity on the landscape, um, farmscape, as well as other landscapes that we might encounter. And working from the pollination level to attract a wider array of native wildlife, not just for the purposes of enjoying that, but also because our existence depends upon it. So, i like to start with where we are today. Uh, we're currently living in the age of the Anthropocene. It's a new geological epoch that's been declared as a result of the impacts of humans upon the planet. And as many as 30 to 50% of all species on the planet are currently heading toward extinction at the rate that we're going by mid-century, so in the next 30 years or so. What is causing that? It's inextricably linked to climate change, but it's also um, linked to humans, Im human impact to the landscape. And so all the scientific evidence out there is telling us we need to work together. We need to work across, across social and economic divides, across political divides to protect the living systems on the planet. So how do we do that? Insects are currently also facing a huge collapse. And this is based, as you can see, from a number of peer-reviewed articles, as well as uh, articles that were published recently in The Guardian. We're currently looking at a potential loss of all insects on the planet within this century. And the, most, um, the, the biggest impact is loss of habitat, loss of natural habitat, natural ecosystems as well as the use of insecticides on our landscapes. And in particular, industrial scale agriculture has been um, recognized by the scientific studies as what is killing our ecosystems, the use of pesticides and the large scale clearing of our landscapes for single crops. Recently, um, a study came out last fall that showed that in North America, we've lost over one in four birds in the last 50 years. And the findings for that were, again, loss of habitat. So if we're looking at our ecological systems on planet Earth, you know, we're starting with insects and then we're moving up to birds. You can see that the numbers are increasing. The impact is increasing as we get to higher trophic levels. And again, habitat loss being a major cause. So how can we reverse this insect apocalypse, as they're calling it? How can we reverse this trend? Well, there was a really great study that was published this month, um, which was a call to action by more than 70 scientists from across the planet. And their biggest um, call to actions were First, to phase out synthetic pesticides and fertilizers. They are absolutely harming life on Earth. Secondly, to 
turn back to nature-based farming, to ways of farming that are more traditional, where we have a mix of crops, a mix of perennials and annuals, where we leave our um, wild areas somewhat intact on the farmscape, as well as reducing emissions, reducing water, light, and noise pollution. And in general, a rewilding of the landscape being necessary to reverse this trend. So what I like to think about um, with regards to all this, this sort of you know, ground truth of where we are at right now is how can we, in, in essence, recreate nature? How can we recreate these natural ecosystems on our landscape and make a dent in what is a pretty intense situation? And so looking at this, um, this map here on the screen, this is from a Harvard forest study. On the left, you have current land use in Massachusetts. The green areas are forest, the yellow are agriculture, and then the red and orange are either urban or suburban development, including roads. On the right side, you have a projection of what the state of Massachusetts will look like in about 40 years if we continue with a business as usual um, way of using the land. It's basically developing the land for the highest profit. And as you can see, what that's doing is it's eating away at those natural ecosystems that are still somewhat intact in 2010. At the same time, these areas of development are actually presenting us with opportunities, opportunities for recreating nature by replanting natural uh, native plant communities that support the widest possible range of native insects and other animals. And so my sort of thesis with all of this and the concept that I use in my own work is how can we look at development and how can we improve upon it by replanting or managing those landscapes in a better way to make connections across the landscape to those areas that are still intact. Because what happens at the pollination scale affects all other life on the planet, all the way up to humans. So why pollinators? Well, let's talk about pollinators a little bit. They're primarily insects, but as well other animals, um, some birds, some bats in other places that fertilize plants and cause them to produce seeds and fruit. They allow them to reproduce. They're responsible for over 80% of the flowering plants on earth. So without pollinators, we would lose over 80% of the flowering plants on earth. That's a pretty big number. In Massachusetts and largely throughout the Northeast, nearly half of our food crops are also dependent upon bees. And it's not honeybees, it's native bees. They're vital to creating and maintaining the habitats and ecosystems that most animals rely upon for food and shelter. So it's not just, you know, the birds and amphibians and mammals, it's also humans. And what's interesting is that some plants are what are called specialists. They only can be pollinated by a particular species or genus of pollinator. And the same goes for the Northeastern native bees, 15% are pollen specialists. So what that means is that if we lose those particular species of bees or those particular species of pollinators, we are also going to lose those plants on our landscape, thereby making it less diverse and less healthy. So when designing for pollinators, I really think it's helpful to think about a native bee and what a native bee needs, because they do the lion's share of pollination, not just of food crops, but also of native plant communities. In Massachusetts and throughout the Northeast, we've got between three and 400 species of native bees of the 4,000 species that are in the US. So it's a pretty biodiverse region. There was a global study that was published last year. They looked at 40 different food crops across 600 unique fields on every populated continent, and they found that wild pollinators, not honeybees, were twice as effective at producing seeds and fruit. Again, looking at a bee, we have to understand how far they can fly 
when we're creating these connections on the landscape, well, the average foraging range of a native bee in the Northeast United States is only between 200 and 1800 feet. So habitat connectivity is really important. 70% of those bees live underground, they ground nest. So how we treat our landscapes is really important. Many of them are solitary, they don't have colonies. And other examples of their habitat include open exposed ground, abandoned rodent burrows, twigs that have died back in the winter where they can tunnel into them and nest and overwinter beetle tunnels and dead wood, dead trees and dead snags. So these are all opportunities for pollinators on our landscape. This is um, a look at basically our common food crops and which native bee groups pollinate them. And as you can see here, Tomato and eggplant are only pollinated by bumbus, which is the bumblebee. And so we really like to look at the bumblebee at landscape interactions in our work because they're so important, not just to food crops, but also to native plant communities, as you'll see. There's also many other significant pollinators on our landscape. We've heard a lot about the monarch butterfly. They go a lot farther than bees. They travel across the North American continent, so they're spreading pollen farther, and they're in a currently an 81% population decline globally. You've also got hummingbirds, and then you've got very specialized Lepidoptera. Here's just a couple of examples, and looking at their specific habitat requirements, I think it's really interesting to think about, you know, what is on the landscape, either where we're living, or where we have a say, if you're a land manager or a land owner, if you work with a conservation organization or even a regional organization, you know, these our landscapes are a matrix and a mosaic of all these different habitats, these wetlands, these marshes, these swamps, these rivers and forests and fields. And there are specific pollinators that live in these areas that they might be absolutely essential for many of the plants that are found in those habitats for reproduction. So what we try to do is to look at each site or each project and really think about what are the plants that belong there and what are the pollinators that we want to support there and then bringing those plants back onto the landscape. So I'm sure um, many of you have heard about colony collapse disorder and this graph is uh, showing you know, the number of honeybee colonies that were in the United States in 1980 was four and a half million. And then in 2005, it dropped down to half, two and a quarter million. What I think is important to mention here is that it's not just honeybees that are dying. Pollinators worldwide are in decline. And it's due to the same factors. It's loss of habitat, loss of these natural ecosystems of plants on the landscape that are clean, that are not contaminated by pesticides. There's also the impacts of climate change. Um, rising temperatures are affecting when plants bloom and that might be throwing pollinators off in certain regions or drought or too much rainfall might be preventing certain plants from growing. And then you have all these parasites and pathogens which are actually brought into the native pollinators uh, communities by the managed pollinators like honeybees, they actually transmit these pathogens to the native um, pollinators. So there's been a lot of um, economic and social support for honeybees in the United States in particular, and a lot of funding has gone in through the USDA and other organizations to really reverse the colony collapse disorder for honeybees. But what this graph is showing us is that since the, you know, the decline in 2005, where we are at our lowest point in recorded history, two and a quarter million colonies or less, we've actually seen a spike and a relatively stable increase in honeybee colonies in the last 15 years. But at the same time, wild bees are down 23% in the United States. And what this graph is showing us is areas that are in yellow have the lowest wild bee diversity by species. Areas that are in blue have the highest diversity. And anyone who's somewhat familiar with what's going on in the U.S. nowadays could easily see that, you know, we have our largest crop producing region here. 
we have the Mississippi River Valley going all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. This is where a lot of our pesticides are. And this is where a lot of our land clearing is, where we've removed those natural prairie ecosystems and replaced them with corn and wheat and soy and canola, what have you. Here you have the Central Valley of California and other region that produces a lot of almonds and a lot of fruits and crops that oftentimes use a lot of pesticides. So you have a real, a real pollinator dead zone here. And then you have here the sugarcane producing region of, um, of Florida. And as you look really largely across the Eastern and Western seaboards, you have lower pollinator species diversity, what lower bee species diversity. And that's really because of habitat clearing for cities and suburbs and farms. These are the areas that have the largest population density in the United States. And what we can learn from that is that by replanting and maintaining a, a diverse community of native plant species, that is what is going to help us buffer against the decline of species like honeybees, which is constantly you know, up and down, as you saw in the last graph. If we can keep our landscape with a mix of the plants that naturally occur there, those native plant communities, we can help to prevent a large scale insect and pollinator die off, which would then in turn cause a wildlife die off and a human die off. Recently, there's also been reporting of a future without bees. Basically, what that means is that there are companies out there that are developing genetically modified honeybees that are resistant to these uh, pesticides. And they're also developing um, robotic drones that are the size of a bee that are being programmed to pollinate. However, according to the UN's FAO, 90% of the world's food supply comes from about 100 crops. 71% of those, 71 out of those 100 crops, 71% depend upon bees for pollination, not butterflies, not moths, not hummingbirds, not bats. And 270 species of wild bees do the bulk of this work. So you can create the best possible genetically modified pesticide resistant bee or drone, and you're still not gonna replace the work of our wild bees, which are so important and it's so simple. There's also a lot of literature out there, as you can see from this list of citations, these are all from peer reviewed journals of the impact that honeybees have on native bees on the landscape. And it's not a good impact. Here's a couple of quotes that I pulled from the, this list of articles on the right, which you're welcome to take a screenshot of and research and read about. So they, um, they looked at what the impact of 40 honeybee hives on a wild area, like basically a conservation property, not a farm, not a residential, not an urban area. For three months, they were using the equivalent of the, the amount of pollen that 4 million wild bees need to reproduce and live. So that's a huge amount. That's something like 100,000 times per bee or per hive, should I say. Each hive is sort of taking away the pollen for 100,000 wild bees, many of which, as I mentioned earlier, are solitary. Honeybees also affect the amount of both long and, long and short-tongued bumblebees, which, are, which represents all bumblebee groups, threatened as well as common. Um, and they also affect other wild insects, including Solitary bees, bumblebees, flies, and other insects on a agricultural crop, not even on a wild landscape. And I love this last quote, conserving honeybees does not help wildlife. So I think that really sums it up. So what is this wild pollination? What does that really mean? Um, the video here on the right is of a bumblebee buzz pollinating a flower. And what that means is that the bumblebee is latching onto the flower and it's sonicating, it's shaking its body to get the pollen to fall off. And that's how certain flowers are um, able to reproduce, such as tomatoes and eggplant. 
Again, this is something that only bumblebees can do. And just like humans, pollinators need nutrient-dense foods, shelter, and a successful opportunity for reproduction. So the comparison I like to make is, you know, would you eat McDonald's if you were starving and that was the only thing available? Yes, of course you would. Would you go there again every day if that was the only place to get food? You probably would. But is that going to make you healthy? Is that going to make you thrive? Is that going to make you successfully reproduce? We, we don't know. And so our natural ecosystems depend so much upon native bees throughout the world. We need to think about what they need to survive and thrive. And it is diverse wild plant communities. I am having trouble forwarding my slide here for some reason. I'm just going to, there we go. Sorry about that, guys. So um, for those of you that are you know, working on productive landscapes, for those of you that farm or garden or are interested in what are the economic benefits, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, looking at wild blueberries. There was a recent study that was done by the University of Vermont, and they compared blueberry farms that had a lot of natural habitat versus blueberry farms that didn't. And what they found was that the farms that were surrounded by the most natural habitat had 20 to 30 times more bee visits and pollinator visits on their flowers per flower. Another study found that bumblebees that were located near honeybees were more likely to have viruses. And so farmers really need to start thinking about this. You know, as we face so many threats to honeybees, you know, it's so unpredictable. I really think that it's important to look at wild pollinators as a reliable source for crop pollination. And the best way to do that is to maintain natural habitat on productive landscapes like farms. What are the economic benefits of this? Well, there was a study done at Michigan State University, and they looked at blueberry farms where they had planted a one acre patch of perennial wildflowers, which cost about $700, which was mostly funded with a state program. During the first few years, they didn't see much of a difference in the crop production, but by the fourth year, farms that had done the one acre planting had a one third percent higher, so 33% higher, sorry, one third overall production rate higher than those that only used honeybees for blueberry reproduction. It was also interesting that the farms that were relying more upon the wild pollinators, those that had done the planting, they suffered less than the ones where it was quote unquote a bad year for pollination, which basically means that the honeybees weren't doing well. These honeybees are kind of like a domestic livestock. You know, they might be healthy, they might be okay. It's really a lot depends upon humans and how we treat them. But what was also interesting was that um, there was a farmer who added flowers throughout his farm and he was able to cut back on using insecticides and he saved about $6,000 a year. So there is an economic argument that can be made. With regards to insecticides, I think it's really important to mention that neonicotinoids, which are quite prevalent in the United States, are very damaging. And they're not just used at farms, they're also used in the nursery trade and sold in stores and found along many landscaped areas, such as homes and schools. They're also on about 90% of the corn grown in the US. And Massachusetts is looking to address that currently with the Pollinator Protection Act, H. 763. At the same time, the European Union has banned many neonicotinoid products, while the EPA currently under the current administration is approving new pesticides. Why are they so damaging? They get deeply into soils, they contaminate our water supplies, and even our tree and shrub communities. And it takes about 80 years for them to be removed from the environment. They've also been shown through scientific studies to be related to the disappearance of not just bees, but butterflies, mayflies, dragonflies, and a range of other insects, including 
earthworms. Songbirds are affected. There was a study that was done that showed that if a songbird ate just one or two seeds that were treated with neonicotinoids, and again, I will repeat, they're not just on corn and soy, but in many seeds that are propagated by commercial nurseries and sold in box stores. And now they're finding that it also impacts white-tailed deer, causing birth defects. And on top of that, there's a whole range of fungicides which are now being seen to be potentially more harmful than neonicotinoids to bees. So the takeaway is that it's really this combination of land clearing, removal of natural habitat, and use of pesticides that is causing the situation that we're in right now locally in the Northeast, in the United States, and globally, as far as insect loss and biodiversity loss. So if you're interested in creating pollinator habitat and you're looking to do something about this, I urge you to not create an ecological trap, which basically means don't create something that attracts pollinators and then causes them to become sick or die. And the best way to do that is to plant native plants, not cultivars or hybrids. Make sure that the plants or seeds you're getting are coming from a source that's pesticide free, not to plant non-native varieties of milkweed, such as tropical milkweed, which doesn't die back in winter. If you have bee housing, if you keep bees, or if you have mason bee housing, make sure to clean it every year because that's another way to transmit those parasites into the um, wild populations. And avoid planting near areas that you know are treated with pesticides. For example, if you're near a big cornfield and it's not organic corn, you want to have a 100-foot buffer of forest in between that field and the area that you're planting for pollinators. So going a little bit deeper into this conversation, beyond what we've already talked about, there's really a lot that goes on at the level of what we plant that has an effect on which pollinators are able to be present on that landscape and that we are able to sustain. I'm going to show you a video of a specialist bee, a long-tongued bee, that is pollinating a plant that has a specialist relationship with it. Wasn't that amazing? That is an example of a relationship at the specialist species level between a plant and a pollinator. And that is a plant that can only be pollinated by long-tongued bumblebees. They're the only group of animals that can force their way into the flower and have a long enough tongue to reach all the way down and get the nectar and collect the pollen in doing so. That plant is not going to be supported if we only have common bumblebee species on our landscape. But unfortunately, most plant lists that you will find online or that are recommended by larger groups or agencies are really recommending plants that are pollinated by common species. And what that means is that we are not ensuring biodiversity. We are not ensuring a wide range of niches in our ecosystems being filled by a wide range of species. Worldwide, there's approximately 300,000 species of flowering plants and there's 200,000 species of animals that pollinate, including bees. They're animals. And what that really shows you is there's nearly a one-to-one -one ratio at the species level of particular pollinators to particular plants. Seeing lots of bees on the landscape does not necessarily mean 
that the landscape is pollinator friendly. You might just have a lot of the same species. Here are some um, research and graphs that were done by Dr. Robert Chagir of the Beecology Project, who's also a scientific consultant at Landscape Interactions, showing the decline of bumblebee species in Massachusetts. So if you look at the blue, the blue bars, those are the historic levels of different bumblebee species in both low elevation areas, which are the areas in beige, and high elevation areas, which are the areas in green, yellow, and orange. As you can see, there's a lot less species, there's a lot fewer species present on our landscape nowadays where the red is the current levels. In the low elevation areas, which is predominantly Eastern Mass and some of Western, you've got mostly Bumbus impatiens. That number is actually going up compared to historical levels in both low and high elevation areas. And then you've got a few other species which are at, largely at numbers that are a lot lower than what they used to be. And in the high elevation areas, you have about four species that are doing okay, two of which are doing really well, Bombus impatiens and Griseocolis, and the rest are either at much lower numbers or in decline. And what that's telling us is that we have a less functionally diverse landscape. We have less of a species diversity of bumblebees, which means we are gonna have less of a species diversity of plants. And it's sort of, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Is it the loss of plants that is causing the loss of pollinators? Or is it the usage of pesticides, which is killing the pollinators and thus preventing the plants from reproducing? I don't really think it matters. I think the, the case in point is that we need, to re, we need to replant these unique plant communities onto our landscape to sustain these specialist pollinators so that we can sustain a healthy ecosystem and, of course, refrain from using these pesticides. Unfortunately, most conservation efforts towards pollinators are really just encouraging increased population of common species like bumbus and patients. And that's what's happening when people are simply buying that pollinator seed mix that they find online or going to that pollinator plant list from a large national or state organization and downloading it. Those lists, there's not a one size fits all solution. Right now in Massachusetts, two out of 11 bumblebee species are extirpated, which means that they're no longer found in the state or barely found at all. And two other species are expected to be gone within the next decade. So again, seeing lots of bees on your garden or on your farm is not necessarily a good thing. It might just all be Bumbus impatiens. And Bumbus impatiens is an example of a bee that has actually done better with less of a plant diversity because they're a generalist. And there's many other bees and butterfly and moth species that are also in decline. So we have to think about them when we're planting and managing our landscapes. So what are some of these um, mistakes or pitfalls that these generic plant lists might present? So here's a plant list that was recommended for the Northeast broadly. It didn't have any specific language about what habitat requirements might be needed for these plants or where they might do well. So first, what's lacking with this plant list is that there's only one plant on it that flowers before the month of May, and that's pussy willow. So if you were to be a very um, good student of this list and buy and source every plant on it and plant it on your landscape, you still would not be providing adequate pollen sources to sustain a wide range of pollinators on your landscape because you'd only have pussy willow flowering before the month of May. Also, pussy willow is a wetland plant that doesn't grow in dry environments. So it's really not, uh, recommended for many sites. And that information is missing from this list. There's not other options for other plants that flower before May. And we really need a wide range of plants flowering before May, perhaps three or four on each landscape to really sustain those bumblebee populations. You've also got in the late period, late summer and fall, all the plants on this list only provide nectar for bumblebees. They're not providing pollen. 
So that's something that's missing from this list. And at, at the same time, there's really no targeted threatened species that this list is trying to address. But the threatened species are the species that we need to help. We don't need to help the bumbus impatiens, the common eastern bumblebee, they're doing fine. Their numbers are actually increasing. And if we can think back a little bit to the article that I showed where it was calling for 70 scientists calling for a way to reverse the insect apocalypse, one of the findings was, one of the major findings of that study was, we need to determine in each region of this earth what are the species that are at the highest risk of extinction and we have to protect them and lists like this are not doing that in fact they're doing the opposite they're encouraging a further homogenization of the landscape so let's look at a couple of case studies of ways in which this might play out and um, examples of some of our work so looking at a farmscape habitat um, this is a common vegetable farm in the Northeast or Mid-Atlantic region. And this is, these are all the opportunities for um, diverse wild pollinator habitat on this landscape. You have the opportunity with hedgerows and a few examples of plants that could do well there that would support threatened pollinators. You have the example of a meadow environment. Fallow fields, fields that are not currently in production cover crops. There's a whole range of native plants that are either self-seeding annuals or nitrogen-fixing plants that would do really well as part of a cover crop mix and would support threatened pollinators. You have these opportunities for field borders in between fields, edge habitat. Even orchards could present an opportunity for threatened pollinators if they contained uh, native fruit producing plants like pawpaw, American persimmon, native berries and roses. You've also got opportunities for um, berry production. It could be, you know, pick your own or um, some sort of a CSA share with native blueberries, huckleberries and elderberry, which also are medicine. And you've got all the opportunities in riparian areas with willows and other plants that are listed here, and as well as nesting areas and all the important habitat benefits they provide. So this is just one example of a way in which a landscape that is certainly in need of production, as you can see here, none of the annual vegetable crop areas were converted into pond or habitat. It's really just those outlying areas that we work with here and where we found those opportunities. This is um, a couple of pages from the Great Barrens Pollinator Action Plan, which I co-authored with um, Elon Bills and Renee Rule a couple of years ago. And this was really looking at a town-wide strategy in Western Massachusetts for how to create pollinator habitat and connectivity across the landscape. So one of the um, important considerations we took was the proximity of different properties. You know, how close were they together? And as you can see here, different native bee species have a different flight rate. And so they're going to have um, more or less connectivity depending upon how far apart those properties are spaced. We also did an analysis of the town to look at where the opportunities were for intact habitat, inter intact native ecosystems, and how could we make those connections. And what we really found was that most of the development and most of the land clearing in Great Barrington was along the river valley which also happened to be the area with the highest biodiversity because it has so many unique uh, ecosystems along the Housatonic. And you have also all of this cleared farmland. So these um, farmed and residential and urban areas actually, while they're currently fragmenting the landscape, they also present the greatest opportunities for habitat as do roads. As I mentioned, the areas with the greatest um, biodiversity were along the river valley. Those were the areas that were core and critical, core habitat and critical natural landscape, priority natural communities in the state um, wildlife protection agencies. So again, how can we make those connections across the river valley? And then you've got all these roads in town, um, 42 miles of which were managed and mowed by the town. 
So it really was up to their own um, Department of Public Works as to how, I'm sorry, 91 miles of local roads. There were 42 miles of state roads, which would be in the hands of the DOT, but 91 miles of local roads that was really within the town's jurisdiction to um, potentially change the mowing schedules and even planting a lot to create more connection across the landscape. And so again, looking at that um, average foraging range of native bees, 200 to 1800 feet that I mentioned earlier, what we did was, so you can see here, the orange properties are those that were town owned, and then you've got all those town owned and managed roads, as well as the farmland. And those were our uh, stakeholders in the project. It was the Agriculture Commission, the town um, Department of Public Works, and the, um, the town staff. So we put a 500 foot buffer on all the farmland in the town, all the town owned properties, and just a 20 foot buffer on all the roads that were mowed and managed by the town. And you can see here all the opportunities for habitat connectivity. And so this is just one example of um, a very local strategy for creating a pollinator corridor and a way to make connections across the landscape from these intact forest ecosystems and wetland habitats. And it really just took a couple of people at the table to get this going. It was just the DPW, members of the Agricultural Commission, and the town manager. Um, this is another example of how um, you can look at a landscape and just conceptually parse out different habitat opportunities, meadows, um, riparian areas, and a trail. Um, this is a tool that we use when we're engaging members of the community and what the before and after might look like for something like a hay field or, an, or a fallow field. Um, residential areas also provide great opportunities. You can do different mowing schedules, different mowing heights, and ways to create that sort of structured habitat. And there was a study that was done in Springfield, Massachusetts, which is predominantly an urban and suburban area, which found that just by changing the mowing practices of mowing once every three weeks instead of every week, they found 110 native plant species, uh, 72 native plant species, 110 native species in general, and um, six new county records and two new state records for bee sightings in those areas, just by mowing less. Solar projects also prevent, present great opportunities, and right now I'm working with a number of solar companies to create pollinator habitat under solar panels and across these larger sites. And the state of Massachusetts, as well as other states, is incentivizing that or considering such incentives at uh, up to $3,500 per megawatt per year for these projects. Here's an example of um, a project that was calling for erosion control and flood mitigation. And um, this area in green, um, the design from the engineer basically just called for a um, riparian buffer zone that consisted of live willow stake plantings. And so by working specifically with native willows, you have all these opportunities for native bees, butterflies, and moths. Then in these areas in orange, this was just calling for a mixed canopy of hardwood trees. There was really no specifics, but if you dial down to those specifics, and if you even just look at a shrub layer with plants from the vaccinium family, you've got cranberries, blueberries, and huckleberries, you've got rhododendrons. Look at all these opportunities for native pollinators. So again, the plant selection is so important when you're, I guess what I'm really trying to uh, make the point here is that pretty much with any project, if you look at the plants and you make those decisions, you can have an opportunity for pollinator habitat, which will emphasize and um, enhance the resiliency of that landscape, make it more diverse in a climate change scenario, improve our local food systems, improve flood mitigation. You know, we're creating rich, mixed um, plant communities, a structure that's not just a, an overstory of trees, but shrubs, um, forbs, and grasses. And all of that is really what's going to work together to sustain wildlife and to sustain our habitat and our natural communities. And this is an example of just some of the toolkits that we um, use um, on our projects to sort of parse out how different 
habitats might look or what the scale might be, the different plant communities involved. You have agricultural hedgerows. You have opportunities for pollinators on woodland edges. And this is a, just a few examples of plants that would support threatened pollinators and threatened bumblebees. Um, with meadow environments and creating meadows, um, there's oftentimes a concern, especially in the Northeast, for ticks. And I like to point people in a study that was done by UConn, University of Connecticut, which found that on a per acre uh, basis, acres of woodland and field that had Japanese barberry, which is an invasive, had eight times as many ticks on them as acres that did not have barberry present. So really, it's not higher grasses and higher flowers that's causing us to become exposed to ticks. It's really the presence of plants like barberry on the landscape and things like deer, white-tailed deer and mouse populations, which nest in and around the barberry. Uh, some of our work is at the community scale and we like to engage stakeholders from all different backgrounds and sectors, as I like to call them. So with the example of Great Barrington, we engaged members of the agricultural community, the Department of Public Works, local landscape designers came to our meetings, people from Parks and Recreation who were in charge of town-owned properties. And what this mix of people coming together does is it builds community, but also it creates different opportunities, different ways into the landscape. You know, what a farmer or a gardener or a homeowner might do is going to be completely different from what someone who mows and manages roads is going to do. And what I like about that is it creates a mosaic of different approaches to the landscape, some of which are more time intensive, some of which aren't. But the combination of those approaches is what creates a diverse habitat for pollinators. And so this is my website. This is um, the company that I founded and that I uh, do my work through, Landscape Interactions. You can reach out to me here. And if I don't answer your questions today at the webinar, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, the ways in which we approach our projects and how we measure the success of our projects is we uh, measure the functional diversity improving over time. So how many native bumblebee species were present on the landscape before the project began and after our planting and maintenance and management recommendations are followed? The plant selection supports a wider richness of species across groups. And we do a three-year study period for all of our projects where we document the baseline criteria, what was on the landscape before the project began, and then what species arrived as a result of our recommendations, our designs, and the, um, the plans that we create. And every project has its own plan and management criteria. You can also um, check out the Beecology app, which was developed by Dr. Robert Jagir at UMass Dartmouth. Um, it's a web app, so it's found through Safari or other web browsers. And you can use it to film or photograph bumblebees that you find on the landscape and Dr. Jagir and his lab will identify those bees for you and it helps build um, these maps that show bumblebee species diversity across the northeast which are largely focused on central and southern New England but rapidly expanding and we're using um, the input of everyday observers, citizen scientists as we like to call them, to help us improve our selection of plants for different landscapes across the region. So um, I can take your questions now, and I thank you all for paying attention to me, hopefully during most of this webinar, and I look forward to hearing your, your questions and your comments. I'm going right. to I guess, pass the mic <laughs> over to you. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Well, that was, uh, I'm telling you, that was an excellent, excellent um, presentation. And like I said, this was, um, you know, we saw part of this uh, at the NOFA conference. So this was right on time and really a continuation of the work that we're doing from the policy that Evan mentioned down to 
uh, having Evan talk a lot more about pollinators. So we do have some questions that came in. Now, in the interest of time, we may not get to everyone's question. So what I will do, um, what, if your question, if you don't hear your question, do not despair or worry. I will actually send them to Evan along with your email if you want to make sure I have your email and that way he can respond to you directly. So we will make sure that everyone's question uh, is answered tonight. So I had a, a question that came in um, concerning your references. Are you able to share your references? You had, it uh, looks like a pretty extensive list. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's going to take, it will take a little time because they're on different slides of the slideshow, but sure. um, go through it and, you know, cut and paste all the citations and put them into a, a document and share that. Absolutely. Okay. Very good. Very good. Um, there was a question that came in that, do you have a site that shows um, the loss for all insects? I do not because unfortunately there's many thousands if not hundreds of thousands of insect species that have not even been documented. You know, we know very little about the insect world compared to what's out there. Um, and even um, native bee surveys are still, you know, really just underway in many parts of the United States. And, Really what's going on is that we're, we're taking the research of Dr. Jagir, which is very comprehensive for the Eastern United States, and we're trying to leverage that and um, corroborate that with other research going on, going on in other areas to really create those plant pollinator relationships. Because it's really, it's one thing to just know, okay, what is out there? What insects or what bees, what, what lives here? But then it's a whole nother thing and a whole nother learning curve to actually know what those insects need to, to live and to sustain their populations. And so we have very good data for bumblebees and we're building better data for other pollinator groups. Okay, very good. Uh, this one is from a local farmer, Merle. Uh, what if you have honeybee hives on your farm? How can native bees compete or coexist on a small farm where there are honeybees? And will simply planting their habitat encourage them to come back to your site? Or are there other strategies that need to be implemented? Yeah, this question comes up a lot. It's very valid. And you know, I, you know, obviously enjoy honey and um, consume it myself and give it to my kids. Um, I think that it's really about what's the right place for honeybees and I think that having honeybees on productive landscapes like farms makes a lot of sense, whereas um, having beekeepers uh, put their hives on you know, wildlife management areas or conservation properties does not make sense. And that's where we really encourage the hives to be moved elsewhere. But on a productive landscape, you know, the hives should be where, um, you know, where people are living and where they're growing their food. I would say that the more you can give for native pollinators, the more you'll be giving to the honeybees as well. The honeybees are generalists. They're going to um, go to the flowers that have the best nectar, and they're going to move pollen by, by gathering that nectar and gathering that pollen. Whereas um, if you have a wide range of native plant communities, you're hopefully going to be sustaining a wider range of bees, especially if you can target some of those specialist plants some of those plants that really depend upon more specialized pollinators, which honeybees are not. Okay. All right, thank you for that. Um, question that came in concerning um, specialized specialization for certain pollinators. Why are some plants specialized for certain species of pollinators? And from the plant's perspective, would it not matter what pollinates as long as it gets done? You know, <laughs> I, you know, I'm not an evolutionary biologist, um, so unfortunately I can't really answer that question perfectly. I think it's a great question, but there's a lot of mystery in, in our world and in our natural environment. And I just, what I know is that these are relationships that have evolved over hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, where for whatever reason, certain plants develop certain physical 
or biological characteristics to attract certain pollinators to have a reliable source for reproduction. I don't know why, but that's just the way that certain plants and pollinators have co-evolved. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Sonia asks, aren't there a lot of trees that flower before May, like red maple? Yes, trees flower before May and so do shrubs. But were any of those trees on that plant list that I showed? They were not. Uh, they may not have been. If you can go back to that slide, or better sure. yet, can we get a copy of your slide to send out to our participants tonight? Yeah, so that slide is from the Xerce Society. What they're basically saying is, here's what you should plant for pollinators in the Northeast. I'm, I'm just trying to get back to it. And yes, we should plant trees for pollinators, absolutely. Now, there is not a lot of data on the relationship between threatened pollinators and trees. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that it's hard to um, do the data collection on trees. They're very big. You need to have a, a climbing structure for them. So what we have very good data on is shrubs and everything under that. But what I like to point out with this is that this plant list, which is for pollinators in the Northeast, has no trees, and it has three shrubs, and only one of them flowers before May. That was the point I was trying to make. Um, there's anecdotal evidence. It's not corroborated by scientific, published scientific research. And Dr. Jagir is working on this at the moment. That is, again, I will say anecdotal evidence, which is showing that there are good relationships between long and medium tongue bumblebees, which are threatened, um, and trees such as sassafras, striped maple, most likely other maples, service berry, spice bush. So the, the evidence is starting to present, but it's going to take a little time before we can pull out that citation and say, absolutely, this is a relationship. And there's also a really interesting um, some interesting work that's going on regarding the relationship between specialist bees and trees. And I'm looking forward to attending a talk next week by um, Joan Milam from UMass Amherst, which is um, in Greenfield. Um, I apologize, I don't know the exact location. It's at a church in Greenfield a week from tomorrow at 7 p.m. And it's on the relationship between bees and trees. But again, I don't know how she's getting that data. What sort of um, what sets apart the way that our data is collected is that it's based on plant pollinator relationships. So finding one bee on a plant is not enough to establish a relationship or a preference. It's the repeated documentation in the field of that species on that species of plant. And that's sort of the data that we're looking at, hoping to get on trees. It's not really established yet. Okay, very good. And as we're winding down um, this last grouping of questions, and for those who, again, who did not hear your question asked, please send me your questions to Anna at nofamass.org. That's Anna, A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, at nofamass, N-O-F-A-M-A-S-S, dot org email me your questions i will get them to evan along with your email address and you can get uh answer from him but the uh last uh, couple of questions are kind of related does having beehives limit my ability to also support native pollinators and do honeybees push native pollinators out this is a person who has an orchard organic orchard and they grow flowers and vegetables you know, I'm I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but the answer is yes, it absolutely does, and the scientific research shows it. Here's at least for, um, I'll just give you guys this slide to look at for now. Um, these are a lot of studies, not all the studies I talked about, but all of the studies here are talking about the negative impact of honeybees on wild bees. And most of them can be found online. At least you can read the abstract, if not the whole study. Some of them require a subscription service to read the entire study, but I believe you can read the um, 
the abstract. And here's just, you know, unfortunately, I'm sorry, but yes, <laughs> honeybees, out, they outcompete native bees and they negatively affect the populations, the abundance, as well as other wild insects. They're not, they're, they don't, they don't belong on most of the landscapes in North America. They shouldn't be there. Mm. Okay. Wow. Okay. Uh, to close out our question and answer period for tonight, uh, Joy sends in this question, how are you measuring the species diversity? Of what? Of uh, bees, pollinators in general, how are you measuring the species diversity? So what we do is, um, you know, it, you could you could look at it like a before and after experiment. I'll go to the um, the slide that sort of parses that out, um, just because I think it's helpful to have something to look at and read while I'm going on and on. <laughs> so what we do is we look at how many bum native bum bumblebee species, native bumblebee species, are on the landscape before we begin any changes, before we plant, before we change mowing schedules, before we make recommendations to move honeybees elsewhere, whatever we're doing on the project, whether it's a school, a private homeowner, a town-wide project, a conservation property, a road system, a solar project, you know, it, we, we do all different types of projects on all different size of landscapes. We, we measure what are the bumblebees, how many species of bumblebees have we found between the months of April and October before we make any changes and then after year one, two, and three of habitat modification, which includes planting, seeding, changing mowing, changing the management of the landscape. So it's a three-year study period and it's using bumblebees as the metric of success or failure of the project. And I, I hope that I've done a pretty good job of showing why bumblebees are a good measure of ecosystem health and diversity. Mm -hmm. We are the predominant native plant community pollinator as well as food pollinator. Mm. Wow. Well, I have to say that tonight, this has been not just informative, but eye opening in terms of pollinators, the real story on pollinators and native pollinators and creating that diversity to keep our native pollinators, plant life and food. And so Evan, I really appreciate and I'm grateful to you for taking the time out to share this tremendous amount of information. Um, Evan, are you presenting anywhere else in the near future? Yes, and um, I thank you for asking because I really didn't even think of mentioning that. Um, I'm going to be presenting at NOFA, New Jersey this weekend on Saturday, February 1st. That is in um, New Brunswick, New Jersey at Rutgers University. I will be going at 10.15 in the morning. I will be presenting at NOFA, Vermont at their winter conference in Burlington, February, I believe it's February 15th. Um, I'll be presenting at NOFA, Connecticut. I think it's on March 7th at their winter conference. Um, I'll be presenting in the town of Lincoln, Massachusetts at an event that's hosted by the Lincoln Land Conservation Trust. That's gonna be on Saturday, March 1st. I believe that's, a, it might be a Sunday. It might be a Sunday, but it's March 1st. Um, I think that covers the next couple of months. Um, just thinking real quick here. Mm -hmm. And can you also put it. up your, your contact page so that people can reach out to you if they have more yeah. specific questions? Um, that would be great. Yeah, so if, if you go to landscapeinteractions.com, um, there's a, a tab at the top that says contact. You can reach out to me there. And you can also sign up for our email list at the bottom of any page on our website. And my email is Evan, E-V-A-N, at landscapeinteractions.com. Um, look forward to hearing from any of you that had any lingering questions. And um, Anna, I just wanted to ask you, 
for the citations that were um, requested from the PowerPoint, where do I post those? Um, if you'd like to send it to me and we can actually post it on our website and we had a few people that requested them, we can get it out to our viewer list. Um, I have to say that we had over 100 people sign up for this particular webinar. So uh, we could do it that way, um, but we will also post it on the website if you're okay with that. So people can just go right to the website and pull it. Sure, I will do that. Um, and yeah, just reach out to me if you feel like anything is still lingering or if you just have any follow-up questions or also if you have any, um, any projects that you think might be interesting to potentially collaborate on. I'm always interested in hearing what people are working on and what they're thinking about doing and offering you know, what I can with regards to oh. that. All right, excellent. Thank you so much. And to continue on with NOFA's um, pollinator events, you know, January was pollinator month, but it doesn't end in January, going into the spring, hot off the press from our education events coordinator, Doug Cook. We have a couple of wonderful, wonderful pollinator events coming up. For those who'd like to get hands-on, actually do this in practice. That's my favorite thing. May 1st, uh, planting a pollinator garden for the afternoon in Beverly, Massachusetts. So anyone in the Beverly area, um, you can attend this workshop. Uh, Keith Zaltzberg from Regenerative Design Group will be leading this. He'll be talking about the key components to a healthy pollinator habitat. And you will be planting a perennial garden with the Centerville Elementary School community. This is a great chance for intergenerational work and learning. And it's wonderful when you work with children, particularly in the garden. Uh, for farmers, and you've heard um, Evan talk about some of the financial benefits of working and making sure you have native pollinators, what it does for you, how some of your crops can increase. But on May 3rd, from 1 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. in Gloucester, inviting pollinators to your farm. We heard a couple of questions about that. We will be learning from Elsie and Tucker Smith of Cedar Rock Gardens about their pollinator-friendly farming practices, including interplanting and no-till methods. Uh, these sound like great workshops. The links uh, to the online descriptions will be up soon. Check our website, go back to nofamass.org to check when the registration will be open for these. I encourage you to go to these. Again, big thank you to Evan. You've heard the listing of events that he will be uh, speaking. If you are in the New Jersey, New Brunswick area, please go to NOFA New Jersey's Winter Conference to see Evan. Um, I tell you, this is just a snippet of what he talks about. And as we walk away duly mentally fed, we know what we have to do to put this into practice.